very fortunate to have with us Mr. Raymond Kelly, the former and longest running commissioner of the New York City Police Department, and moderator Gail Lemon from the Council on Foreign Relations. So, please. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, I always love competing with everybody's meals, but luckily we have the longest serving uh, New York City Police Commissioner and a Marine Colonel here with us, all in one person, uh, here with us today. And I think when uh, we both signed up, I'm not going to speak for the commissioner, but certainly when I signed up to coming today, I didn't realize it would be quite so interesting a moment in American history uh, as we seem to find ourselves in today. Uh, I want to say uh, I'm delighted to be here. This is my fourth time at West Point in the past year. So uh, having been here with Ashley's War, and, and it's a privilege, and I think the idea of having this conversation today with Commissioner Kelly is uh, an exciting opportunity to look at where we are at this moment and what to see uh, coming ahead. I want to start a little bit by giving a rather fancy laundry list of the Commissioner's background. He is an attorney, uh, as a JD from St. John's, a Kennedy School grad. He is a, a, a visiting uh, fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, and has 11 honorary degrees. So for any of you who need some, you know where to come. And he is also the vice chair at uh, K2 Intelligence. He's written this book, which I honestly cannot recommend uh, enough. Mine is dog-eared, and I have a lot of books, like a lot of you, that sit on my nightstand hoping to be read. Uh, and this one actually was thoroughly read and noted, and I think offers you a front row seat. Uh, I'm from Washington, D.C. and from Prince George's County, Maryland. And, and growing up, we used to go to Caps games. And for those of you who remember the old Capitol Center and the nosebleed seats, you always had the most raucous real view of what was happening on the ice below. And I think this book is like that. It is a real view, it's a raucous view, and it's a very personal view of the idea of how you keep America safe. So with that, uh, my favorite quote from this book uh, is, and there were many, is, calm like anxiety and uproar is almost always contagious. And I think in this moment, calm is most likely very uh, needed. And I'd like to ask you to start with, how do you see the threat facing America in this moment? And what did last Tuesday mean to you in regards to the idea of keeping America safe? Well, thank you. It's an honor to, to be back at, uh, at West Point. Uh, what does uh, next uh, West Tuesday mean to us? Well, we're strong, resilient country. I think, obviously, uh, there was a shock in, in a lot of quarters. Uh, people did not uh, anticipate this. Uh, I've seen these demonstrations that have been conducted, quite frankly. When I thought about it, I thought the demonstrations would be more, would be larger. Uh, they seem now to, to dissipate, so uh, be dissipating. So I, I think, uh, you know, this country will <laughs> go on and uh, we'll have to adjust. What we're adjusting to, we're not certain because we haven't seen any appointments. We haven't seen certainly any statements of policy from uh, President-elect uh, Trump. Uh, so it, the, it is a, a vacuum uh, for now. And um, I think there's concerns about some statements that have been made that indicate perhaps a, you know, a backing off from uh, involvement in Europe, uh, certainly concerns about uh, NATO, whether or not uh, uh, under a Trump administration we would respond to Article 5 and, and defend, you know, NATO members. So that's sort of, uh, you know, buzzing out there, but quite frankly, we have to see some uh, appointments and people that, that uh, he's going to put in place before we can say definitively what, uh, you know, what we think is going to happen. You're someone who I think is a rare bird at this moment in the sense that you worked with Michael Bloomberg. You have very positive things, or at least uh, more forgiving than many things to say about David Dinkins in your book. And you worked under Bill Clinton. Your name has been floated as some, by, by Mr. Giuliani, among others, uh, as potentially uh, Homeland Security, FBI. I just wonder, how do you think about whether you would serve yeah, well, that's a hypothetical question because nobody has asked me, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to go there uh, until 
<clears throat> I engage in discussions with people if, in fact, they, you know, they want to talk to me. When you think about another 9-11 style attack, how do you expect, you've known a lot of these players from New York City, how do you think or what do you worry about or hope uh, would come from a, a potential uh, Trump administration response to, uh, from a Trump administration response to a post 9-11 attack once more? Well, I think the federal government has been generous, if that's the right word, uh, with New York City since 9-11. We were able to put in place a very robust counterterrorism program. Uh, we think we made the 1.7 square miles south of Canal Street in Manhattan the safest business district uh, in the world. We have thousands of cameras, detection equipment, th those sorts of things. So I don't think it would be fair to say, hey, we need more resources, more than what we've been, uh, we've been uh, getting. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll just have to... Uh, have to see, but thanks to the Department of Homeland Security, uh, we we believe we have the, you know, the safest uh, business area in, anywhere, and the, you know the the World Trade Center tower now. Uh, if you read in the book, that the plan was actually changed, the the tower was actually moved because even the uh, uh, the cornerstone was uh, was moved uh, initially. Politics took over, and the politicians wanted to put a glass tower, 1,776 feet high, on the corner of West and, and, and Vesey Street, which is an area that was, uh, of course, attacked uh, in, in 1993. So it, it made no sense to us to put that glass tower at that intersection. But it was, it was a political decision. It was very difficult for us to turn it around. But in the book, we, you know, we talk about how, how we did it. Ultimately, the tower was moved 25 feet for more standoff, and the first 20 floors are basically cement. Uh, there is some mechanical things inside there, but there's nobody occupying it. And that was to uh, make it certainly a more defensible position as far as a uh, uh, improvised explosive device concerned. When uh, you, uh, the president-elect Trump makes a cameo in your book about this, how politics became part of this. Everybody had something to say about what uh, the towers would look like. Right. Uh, and you talk in this book that's detailed 16 uh, potential attacks that were thwarted. Uh, how much does politics interfere with keeping Americans safe? Well, I had the... Uh, great fortune of working for Michael Bloomberg. And uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg is all about business. Because of his vast resources, he didn't need to go to the political clubhouses. He didn't need to go to the unions to staff his uh, administration. So he picked some really uh, quality people. And I myself had very little uh, involvement in, in sort of a, you know retail politics. Uh, uh, we went about doing our job, and City Hall took care of the, the rest. And I think it's fair to say that M Mayor Bloomberg was not affected by it either because he just was not going to do a business like that. So he enabled us to construct a counterterrorism program that uh, doesn't exist any anywhere else. We were able to bring in expertise from outside of uh, uh, city government, from the federal government, CIA, DIA, DEA, uh, Marine Corps, and um, put in place a, a counterterrorism uh, structure that, as I say, didn't exist anywhere else. David Cohn, for instance, was a 35-year veteran of the Central Intelligence Agency, the only person to be in charge of the analytical and operational sides of CIA came in. We, we wanted to just back up and say that after the uh, horrendous events of September 11th, Mayor Bloomberg was elected between the time he was elected and when he actually took office, we wanted to put in place or put the plans in place for a, a counterterrorism uh, structure, uh, unlike any that existed in so the municipal, the city municipal level. level. Right. Uh, because I was police commissioner in 1993 during the first attack, and quite frankly, we didn't learn too much from that time, from that experience. We had the second attack we wanted to supplement 
what the federal government was doing, certainly not supplant it, we couldn't do that, but we wanted to add our own capacity to uh, help to identify uh, threats. And the NYPD is the biggest police department in the country by far. 54,000 employees, 36,000 uniformed officers. So we had the, the size to, to do it. We needed the imprimatur on the part of the, the mayor. That's certainly what we got. So we brought in these uh, folks with lots of talent, lots of expertise in areas that police officers simply don't have. You know, they're great, they're great, they'll do what you tell them, but they just don't have that, that level of experience. So we wanted to hit the ground running, and that's what we did. I wanted to, uh, because of my, you know, Marine Corps active in reserve, I had three older brothers in the Marine Corps, so I sort of partial to the Marine Corps, and I wanted to get a general uh, to run a counterterrorism operations, and I, I interviewed a few of them, and Frank Labuti, a recently retired Marine Lieutenant General, you know, Vietnam, Silver Star, uh, was the ideal person uh, for that. And then after, after those two folks were in place, that's uh, Dave Cohn and Frank Labuti, we were able to bring in analysts and, and uh, people from the top educational institutions, Harvard, Yale, service academies, uh, to help uh, us not only gather information, but to synthesize it and uh, make it digestible for uh, police officers in the, you know, in the field. Right. Uh, so a lot of things happened, a lot of, a lot of moving parts. We ultimately assigned our police officers to 11 cities overseas to act as uh, listening posts and, and, and tripwires. And because of the size of the department, we were able to recruit uh, people with diverse backgrounds. Now in NYPD, there are police officers born in 106 countries. And because of that diversity, we're able to take people and put them in, in place. We have them, for instance, in Abu Dhabi, in Amman, Jordan, in, in Madrid, in Paris, London. And for those of you who, who want to learn more, NBC News just did a piece and decided your work is following the NYPD in Europe, talking about NYPD looking at the terror threat in Europe, bringing information back, which was really begun under your administration or under yeah. your leadership. So we did a lot of things, and there were 16 plots against the, uh, the city during uh, the Bloomberg administration's time. Uh, none came to fruition, some because of good work on part of the FBI, some as a result of good work on the NYPD, and sheer luck. Uh, we had Faisal Shahzad drove into Times Square on uh, May 1st of 2010. It was not on anybody's radar screen. He tried to blow up his uh, uh, utility vehicle uh, with propane tanks and other sort of jerry-rigged uh, items, and it simply didn't work. He dumped it down, but we knew nothing about him. Uh, we arrested him two days later, and he freely admitted everything he, he did. He was quite, quite proud of it, but we were just lucky uh, with him. So, uh, I mean, I, they still want to come to New York. There's no, no question about that. And I think the, the structure that was put in place uh, has to uh, be kept in place for the foreseeable future. On that idea of structure, there <coughs> is concern that ISIS or others uh, will use this moment of a change of power in the United States to launch uh, an attack. And how concerned are you about the idea that the new administration would be tested? Any more concerned than you were uh, before last Tuesday? I think it's inevitable that they'll be be tested. You know, that's <coughs> what's going to happen. <coughs> I think to a large extent because we don't know, you know, what the what the policies are. I don't see it as being a necessarily a particularly vulnerable time, but I do see a test in the in the offing. Uh, going to happen whether it's overseas or here. We don't know, but the lone wolf, <coughs> you know, is is the threat that we all talk about. And it's very difficult to, to predict. <laughs> Although, you know, we've seen these exhortations on the internet to go out and, and do things. Uh, it's difficult to measure who listens to it and who reacts to it. But it's it, it's going to be with us for a long time to come. I want to pick up a little bit on what you said and then go back to two case studies that are in the 16 in the book. 
Um, <coughs> you talk about uh, how many different countries members of the New York City Police Department come from. And you really talk in the book about the strength of diversity and how it actually made the city more secure. And I wonder, there's been a lot of discussion of late about members of minority communities feeling concerned about what comes next. And I wonder if some of the campaign rhetoric, you know, do, does that matter? Does that hurt NYPD's efforts to be embedded in communities? Because you talk a lot about, uh, in the book, how much it meant. You, you served halal food at cricket matches uh, in New York City. There was that level of really being part of different communities. You know, law enforcement is largely a local uh, matter. Uh, and I don't think it hurts uh, that much. As a matter of fact, I think you could say that as a candidate, Trump pointed out certain things in, in the cities that uh, were not pointed out before. You know, people simply, we do have a disproportionate amount of crime, violent crime in, our, in major cities, and I think that's something that should be focused on, and uh, he, he brought the matter up, and he was, you know, he was criticized for that, but I, I, I don't see that rhetoric as being a problem or a holdover problem. I'm going to go to two case studies. First of all, before you, we were there and you were uh, leading at the time of the first World Trade Center attack, um, what do you think should have been learned at that time? Do you wish you would have had learned? Well, I don't think we fully grasp the size and the scope of the terrorist threat and their international reach. What happened with the first World Trade Center attack is the first arrests were made six days after the attack. Actually, I live right across the street from the World Trade Center. I was there that the attack happened on Friday. I was there on Sunday when they carried out a differential of a truck. It turned out to be the rider rental truck and it had a hidden VIN number and it was identified right, right away, that actually Sunday night, as being a rider rental uh, truck. So the individuals came <coughs> back for their deposit. $100 deposit on a truck or whatever. And that's when the first arrest was made and they were rolled up very quickly after that. So they were actually, you know, they were made fun of. They were laughed at by this sort of st stupid move, if you will, to uh, get their deposit back. Of course, they thought that they were covering up the fact that, hey, this truck was stolen. We don't know what, what happened to it. So it, it, it did not take the, on the, the importance of, uh, uh, that it should have. And I think uh, the federal government uh, should have done more. I went into the federal government uh, shortly after, well, 1996. And uh, I was the Under Secretary of Treasury and the Customs Commissioner. Terrorism was not a, a major topic of, of discussion. Totally different from the so time. So it should have been a wake up call for us. It was not, of course, we paid the price on on September 11th, in my view. We've had the event, events overseas, <coughs> with, you know, Cobar Towers, that, that sort of thing, the coal, but we weren't really focused on the domestic threat. 2004, uh, you talk about the book about uh, the uh, politicization, or uh, that people talk about, about uh, homeland security threats. How, how much do you worry about that, that, that politics can really interfere with the job of keeping America safe? Well, it certainly can. <clears throat> There's always that potential. And, it, and it, it, you're talking about in the book, in 2004, uh, the administration surfaced a, a threat that uh, was seen to be or was announced to be eminent. And in reality, what it was was information gathered by someone, uh, uh, Asa al-Hindi was his nickname, the Indian, who went and gathered information, did a in-depth survey of the New York Stock Exchange in the Citicorp building, and sort of marketed that overseas. This was made to be a, uh, a, a, an imminent threat, uh, as I say. And, uh, uh, Tom Ridge was the Homeland uh, Security uh, Secretary then, and he participated in that, and it turned out to be not nearly, uh, you know, uh, as high a level threat as it, it should have been. He felt guilty about it, 
said that in his book and, and, and resigned as, as a result of it. We were on a, on a conference call and uh, it, we asked questions about the, uh, you know, the, the severity of it, the credibility of the threat. None of that was, was forthcoming. And it turned out, of course, in September of that year, uh, well, actually this happened in August, a month later, was the convention, uh, the Republican uh, National Convention. And uh, that, that was apparently, you know, ginned up to help in the, in the convention and obviously the, the election. So, yeah, is there a, a threat of that happening? Yeah, and you have to, I think, very closely guard against it. How do you guard against it? You know, your, your own credibility is at, uh, at stake here, and you need to, as m best you can, uh, determine the, the uh, uh, accuracy, the truthfulness of these, of these threats. Most information, as everybody here knows, I'm sure, is a lot of intelligence information is contradictory, it's complex, it doesn't come in in nice, neat, uh, neat packages. So you, you, at least you have to be aware of the possibility of it being politicized. You uh, are a combat veteran. You led Marines uh, in Vietnam, and you've talked a lot about community-level policing. You've also said you don't think that troops should be used in the fight against ISIS, and you use regional powers. So you've looked at both the connections between what happens on the ground in America and what's happening in America's wars overseas. So you've looked at all of this, and you've gotten very, you know, I think you've talked a little about this, but America's gotten very good at countering terrorism, but much less successful about countering ideology. And I wonder how you think uh, about the, the, what you call the, sort of the vexing problem of the inspirational aspect of groups like ISIS. Yeah, that's a good question, because there is a, uh, there's an organization, Counter Extremism Project, which has just contacted me. So I'd, I've been talking to them. It's not easy uh, to do. And, uh, you know, so much of the current issues are based on the Sunni Shia conflict, which we don't necessarily <laughs> pay that much attention to or realize that they, some of these issues go back 1,400 years. And the idea that you're going to change a lot of people's minds, I think, is, is uh, somewhat of a, of a pipe dream. So I think it is difficult. To, to change the, uh, uh, the ideology. I think we should try. I think we, in, in terms of messages going out on the internet, I think we have to do a more effective job of just uh, eliminating the, uh, as much as we can. Now, this organization does some of that, has a contract with uh, the Department of State, but it's, uh, you know, it's a daunting task. I, I don't think it's... Uh, it's something that you can put a lesson plan together and go talk to, uh, you know, people and change their minds. If you were going to say one to three things that you think are very important for the next administration to think through in terms of deterring the threat. Um, <coughs> well, in terms of terrorist threat? Mm -hmm, yes. Um, well, I, I think a lot of what's going on now uh, uh, sort of has to uh, continue. I don't see any major uh, changes that's going to turn it turn it around. Uh, I think that uh, one thing we might do is uh, I would never put troops on the ground in the Middle East. You know, uh, combat troops. I I I think that Trump's position certainly was Secretary Clinton's position, um, and and President Obama's uh, position. We might increase our special operations capacity. In, in terms of uh, increasing those troops, there's only so many of them, of course. Maybe putting them afloat uh, off off the coast of, uh, you know, Syria. Uh, I, I think there's only sort of marginal things that, uh, thanks a lot, that can be done. Uh, I, I don't think there's any dramatic change. But we'll see. We'll see who they they put in place and see what ideas they they um, uh, come up with. I want to go back a little bit to your own upbringing, which is sort of front row seat for New York City and, and the city that uh, is changing right before our eyes. Um, you, can you tell us a little bit about the apartment building that you 
grew up in, which was, uh, I would say, my, my mother grew up in West 44th Street between the 9th and 10th. And Walter Matthau was right above her and would play golf when he would come. He would right? hit a golf ball in down the, the uh, hallway in the, in the apartment building. It was a different New York than, than the one you, you see today. I grew up in the west side of Manhattan, and uh, it was largely an uh, Irish and Italian uh, neighborhood. Uh, then there was an influx when I was, oh, maybe eight years old, West Side Story type of situation where a large influx of people from Puerto Rico uh, came in and uh, the neighborhood, you know, the turf issues uh, arose and there was a lot of the, the fighting that uh, you would think would, would take place, you know, sharks and jets uh, type of things. I, I talk about it, my, my brother was, uh, we saw him walking down the street with a chain or something with a group of other people, my older brother, uh, and uh, my mother shouting out at him, stop, go back, go back. And him ignoring her. And then the police, her. the police came around the corner and stopped that. But so I was involved in, in some of that, and uh, my father moved us to Queens when I was 13 because of that, that uh, concern. But it was a, uh, in my particular building, we had people, not only Irish and Italian, but we had uh, a Swedish family, a German family, so it was uh, a little bit of a United Nations type uh, operation there. And I, when I was thinking about this, you were talking about how your apartment, if it were still standing, would probably be one family with one child for seven thousand, you know, X thousand dollars yeah, yeah. per month. And I wonder what you think the fact that we don't see so many of those mixes, so much affordability of, of working families in the city, uh, means for the fabric of, of America. Well, you can see the city changing, just as you said, uh, almost before your eyes, because you have major developers uh, filling in every space, tearing down the tenement buildings that, that I grew up in, and uh, changing the fabric of the neighborhood. Uh, people that we, in my company, uh, you know, it's very difficult for young people coming into the company to find a place to live. Uh, so they're, they're living two and three to, uh, to an apartment. It's not getting an, any better. I mean, that's just the way of the world. I, you know, I don't know how you reverse that. There's an effort to construct affordable housing in New York City, but it's always sort of cans kicked down the road. And the numbers are never, uh, never enough. So it, this is the world in, in, in which we live. And uh, uh, I, I don't see the rents going down, that's for sure. In New York City, you talk about uh, Mayor Dinkins and how he do actually don't think he got a lot of credit for some of the uh, success in fighting crime that came after him. I wonder, what did that teach you in, in terms of getting ahead of a narrative as you go forward and lead in organizations that are trying to deter? Well, what? actually, what I said about Mayor Dinkins is he got a lot of blame for Crown Heights, uh, the Crown Heights riots, when he did not uh, deserve it. Actually, the police department uh, uh, was the cause of, of, of a lot of the issues there. I was the number two guy in the police department at the time, but I wasn't in the operational uh, loop. And what happened is we had an African-American mayor, African-American police commissioner, African-American chief of the department. So uh, the chiefs in the field were sort of reading the tea leaves. And uh, the Crown Heights incident was when a Yanko Rosenbaum, actually it was an automobile accident where a kid was killed. Uh, and in the car was the Grand Rebbe, or in one of the cars, which was the head of the Labavitch sect, the Hasidic uh, sect. Uh, a child was killed in that, in that accident that night uh, there was roving bands, and Yankel Rosenbaum, a, a rabbinical student, was stabbed. He died in the Kings County Hospital. He died as a result of uh, really malfeasance on the part of the, uh, the hospital. But that set about riot for the, uh, the next few days, <clears throat> and the police department, the operational people, uh, were backing off, and ultimately, uh, Commissioner Brown and Mayor Dinkins gave me the sort of operational control, and I, I called in the chiefs and asked them what what's going on here. Well, they were they were trying to be politically correct. They uh, you know we had most of the people who were quote rioting were 13 years old, and Lee Brown, who had come from Houston, said, "Hey, how can we, why can't we handle them? These are kids, these are kids." And there really was no adequate answer. So we were able to 
to uh, shut it down the next day with some mounted police and, and additional police officers. But some of the answers they gave, these are good people, want to go to work, and we have to keep the streets open. Uh, I chewed them out for Mayor Dinkins not having enough security, and they said, well, oh, I don't have anybody on the roof. Well, it's dangerous <laughs> on the roof. You know, that's what you get paid, paid for, Th those sorts of things. So Mayor Dinkins took the brunt of the, the blame for that, but uh, uh, it, it really wasn't his, uh, you know, wasn't his direction, certainly. The police department should have responded, responded uh, more uh, quickly and with a larger, uh, a larger force. You're, uh, at the end of the book, you actually have a lot of recommendations for policing, including in favor of cameras, uh, in favor of uh, college degrees for police and, and really concerned about the militarization or, or the amount of weaponry that has come from the military to police forces. Right. We, how do you think about what do you think are the most important priorities of the list you have really offering recommendations for being part of communities, getting back to community focus? Well, some of them would, would take a long time, no, no question about it, to put in place. But I think a college degree should be required for every, every police, four-year baccalaureate degree. Uh, we don't hire teachers anywhere in the country without a, a, a four-year baccalaureate degree, yet we give police officers life or death uh, uh, capacity, ability, and we certainly throughout America, uh, the, the requirements are uneven, and uh, the job has gotten a lot more complex, much more demanding, and this will require probably a commensurate raise in pay, but that's a price that I think uh, society should pay. I think the uh, uh, cameras, video cameras, the, the, the time has come for uh, p police to wear the body-worn uh, cameras. Everybody over 10 years of age has a uh, cell phone. So we see these pictures uh, put on, on YouTube of events uh, involving the police. Most of them start in the middle or uh, two-thirds of the way in of an incident. Uh, I think t to the extent that police are engaged in in inappropriate behavior, it will it will act as a deterrent, but will also, for the most part, show the good work that that the police are uh, are doing, and they are very beneficial work for uh, society. Lots of problems with them. Uh, who has access to them? Uh, when do you have access to them? They're expensive. The uh, you know the uh, uh, keeping of this data can be uh, uh, very expensive for a small uh, police department. I think the federal government has to help out, out there. But I, I think it will go a long way in recapturing some of the trust that has been lost with some of these, these high profile uh, and shootings that, uh, that we've seen. My last question before we open it up. Uh, in talking about trust, you talk a lot about diversity and actually why it matters to have a force that includes uh, Muslim Americans, African Americans, communities that are as diverse as, as uh, you know, police officers are as diverse as the community they serve. If people came to you and said, you know what, this is important, it's a, but it's not a must have, it's a nice to have, what is your counter to that? Why does it matter? It makes the job much easier. Uh, you know, I've been in policing a long time, and many, many uh, incidents that uh, I've encountered and that you encounter in big city police departments where having uh, a police force of police officers that look like the people they're policing is very helpful. It just, it, it just is. Uh, not only do I think it's the right thing to do because you want to have a department that, you know, reflects the people you serve, it just makes these types of encounters uh, easier. It's smarter. It's smarter policing. Uh, I want to open up uh, the room, and I, I want to say there are fourth year Marine Corps who is guided by the leadership principles. You say you look at them every day in the Marine Corps. So remember that uh, when you ask uh, your questions. So come here, and they'll go to the back. Thank you for your comments today. I'll read them. Thank you. Thank you.
I'll get it. Gail. Gail. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Gail, I'm sorry, just real sure. quick. Because we're recording this, do you mind repeating Absolutely. the question I so we have it do on? Anyway. Okay, no thank problem you. At all. The <laughs> question was really about the tension between some of the more controversial techniques, uh, which a questioner was asking about, um, confidential informants, sting. Uh, how do you think about the civil liberties m imperative versus the strategic effectiveness? And can some of these techniques undermine the social fabric uh, that it really is uh, there to, in theory, protect? Well, I consider myself a civil libertarian. I'm an attorney. Uh, it's something that we were very conscious of. We had a cadre of first-rate uh, attorneys vet uh, everything that we were doing in the uh, in our in intelligence division. There is a, a ongoing now a lot of communication between the police and the, the, the Muslim uh, community. I would go to mosques about maybe once every six weeks and have sort of a town hall meeting. Uh, I think there is a, 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 there is a level of activists who are concerned. Certainly some of their concerns are legitimate, but the vast majority of people in, in the Islamic communities in, in New York City, they want to be safe too. They want to have interaction with the, uh, with the police, and, and they do. And it's not something that's written about, uh, but there's an awful lot of work being, going on, not only in New York City, but in other um, uh, communities where you have perhaps a significant Muslim population of, of uh, communication. Now, uh, in New York being the most litigious environment in the world, uh, there are lots of lawsuits that, uh, that have, been brought, have been brought. Nothing has really come to uh, fruition. There's been some... Uh, Settlements that are, you know, really didn't amount to anything at all by the current uh, current administration. So, I think I'm, I, I'm, I'd like to sort of allay your concerns about whether or not there's any focus or thought about civil liberties or civil rights in the police department. There is a lot, <laughs> and and we, as I say, we brought in lots of people, uh, attorneys, to uh, make certain that we were doing things that were. Uh, uh, you know, according to Hoyle. There was a series of uh, stories written by the uh, AP, two writers, <coughs> Matt Apuzum and Goldman, who uh, then uh, took those uh, stories and made it into a book. They got a Pulitzer Prize for it. It was preordained, in my, uh, my opinion. Uh, it was a, a, a compilation of half-truths, things that were made up, uh, and uh, given by some disgruntled uh, employees. It took papers that we had in 2006, which is pretty early on in the, in the uh, you know, putting our program together, and used some of that. And uh, it was well written, but it was just baseless. So, so uh, in my view, a lot of the criticism that, that came about directed at the NYPD sort of goes back to those series. And I was asked the question by the Wall Street Journal, what, you know, what is the result of the publication of these uh, of this book these stories what what was what changed and the answer was nothing we weren't doing anything wrong we weren't doing anything I illegal anything un untoward so you know when you, we read it we just simply didn't uh, after a, it's obviously a consultation with uh, my staff we simply uh, continued to do what, what we were doing do we use undercovers sure uh, and, and the undercovers did terrific work. We had a special way of recruiting undercovers that uh, we trained them like no other undercovers that ever been been trained. We put them in neighborhoods and set them up in homes, that, that sort of thing. They did great work. Did we use confidential informants? Of course. I mean, you're fighting crime. It doesn't forget, New York was the city. <laughs> we put this in place after we had 3,000 people killed. Uh, you know, so. Um, just to reiterate, we are, the department is uh, very much focused on civil rights, civil liberties. We have, we have um, advisory groups of uh, Muslims. I made certain that we weren't just sort of preaching to the choir, that these were people who had legitimate concerns, and we met with them. I met with them on a regular basis, put advisory groups in on, on the, uh, in the outer borough uh, uh, Level. So a lot of communication and uh, a lot of legal oversight. 
one follow up on that. Because you worked so hard on that, what do you make of rhetoric then that, that came out in the campaign that Muslims, Americans were not part of the part of the solution and it was really seen as by some law enforcement folks I talked to not helpful in terms of the community links that they were working on building. You mean, you mean uh, well, uh, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it was helpful, uh, you know, but uh, things are said in, in, in campaigns that uh, in retrospect should never have been, have been said. But, um, I, I, I think uh, if we were able to get that story out, the original question was about getting a narrative out. Mm -hmm. We were able to get uh, the story out about what we were doing. People will feel much differently. But it, you, only, you have very narrow channels to get the story out. And uh, if, if a newspaper decides not to write it uh, or not to put it on the television, that's really the only way you have to communicate uh, with, with the public uh, at large. And there was a lot of selective uh, uh, decisions as far as what should be written about and what should be written about in, in New York. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, the question is from Charlotte, North Carolina, which she says is still reeling from uh, the violence, and wondering how do you address hidden bias from on the part of the police, on the part of those in uniform, uh, in dealing with people who are not like them, whether it is on gender or on race, and how what do you think could be lessons learned from the New York City example? Well, I think it's, it's difficult to address hidden bias. I think we probably all have them, but what you have to address is the manifestations. You can't really get into someone's head, but you hold them accountable for their actions. And I think that has to be done. We've seen, for instance, in, in uh, North Charleston, South Carolina, we saw, the, we saw a murder by Police officer Michael Slager of Walter Scott. This is where he shot him in the back, and uh, that, you know, that's outrageous. That is something that has to be uh, fully uh, followed up in the criminal justice system. The trial is is ongoing now. Uh, I would submit that uh, my, you know, long time in in law enforcement, that events like that are clearly an aberration. But I can see where people would say, aha, suspicions confirmed. Now we have video that shows that these sorts of things uh, uh, went on. Um, but getting, you know, in, implicit bias is not easy to identify, not easy to address. And I think we're going to be talking about this for a long time because it's the new, new thing, you know. But it's much more significant on my part is to hold people accountable for you know, for their actions and to, uh, you know, monitor. You can, there's ways of monitoring police officers who, who are uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, prejudicial in their actions when it comes to certain groups, ethnic groups, that, and that sort of thing. You have to you have to look at where people are assigned, what their what their job is, that that sort of thing. But there there are ways of, of monitoring that. Um, I, the issue of of implicit bias, I just think is very, very difficult to identify. Although we now see classes, you know, uh, in, in police academies that, that address that. Um, Andy, from this side, yes. Yeah. Um, one of the thoughts you mentioned earlier uh, was Faisal Shahzad, <coughs> a few others, including Nazi Benghazi. <coughs>
2017. And is the threat as serious? Is it, is it just is it less serious, or is it just different from what it was even just a few years ago? So, well, I, I, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, the question was, uh, Faisal uh, Shahzad Najibul Zazi, how has the threat evolved and what has that meant for law enforcement and how do you see that threat taking shape in 2016 and 17? Is it neutral, worse, uh, or easier to deal with? All right. Well, you're obviously familiar with some of these cases. Faisal Shahzad went to the Pakistani Taliban, was given a game plan, was given uh, sort of ingredients to make a bomb. Uh, he went uh, in attempting to put it together he uh, got a little bit frightened that he'd be identified, and he dumbed it down. Najibu Zali, Zazi, again, went with his two companions <coughs> to, uh, to Pakistan and was given specific instructions as, as to what to do. Now we see <coughs> the emergence of these the lone wolf, inspired by the Internet, um, actions very simple. <coughs> we see the, we see AK-47s and and assault rifles being the weapon of choice. You see the uh, Pulse nightclub in Orlando where 100 people are shot, 49 are, are dead, with, the, with a very simple weapon, AR-15. And, uh, you know, we see this in the, even in the Paris, in the Bataclan uh, attack in the Charlie Hebdo. So in, in that sense, it's become simpler to do and more difficult to spot. It doesn't take too much to uh, get a rifle, certainly not in this country, and go shoot a lot, a lot of people. Or, as was recently put out, uh, you know, urging people to take the same actions that were taken in Nice by a truck driver. So <coughs> the moving parts plan from Al-Qaeda, I think, has faded. It is the individual making their own decision. Just like uh, uh, the, the fellow who blew up the bomb in, uh, on 23rd Street in, in Manhattan in, in, in September. I mean, his tradecraft was atrocious. So he's learning that, you know, someplace, on the internet or whatever, and, and putting it together. So law enforcement is, is uh, at a disadvantage in identifying uh, people like that. With chat rooms, Chat rooms now have become a lot more narrow, where you have individual one-on-one -on -one chat rooms that are much more aware of, of group chat rooms, that, that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's not easy. And uh, uh, the department still uses uh, undercover officers, obviously confidential informants. We had um, one fellow who uh, we were able to get uh, 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 close to and uh, he was born in the Dominican Republic, comes up and uh, again gets, gets uh, radicalized on the internet. But we were very, very fortunate. He wasn't talking to anybody. And we happened to get a room that we built and, and put a camera in and got him to, to go into this room and watch him put together his bombs, his three, three elbow bombs. And uh, he did it with uh, matchstick. Uh, tops, 600 matchstick tops, and after we arrested him, we took him out, and certainly they they worked. So we were very fortunate to get that that one person next to him. But the the lone wolf is what we have to be uh, concerned about, and it's very very difficult for law enforcement to do much about it. The earlier plots where you have people getting together and meeting were much easier for us to detect if, in fact, it were happening now. So I, I don't have an easy answer for that. Other questions? I was thinking. Please.
I'm going to tell you something that I think made a big difference <clears throat> in the NYPD and um, reduced violent crime significantly. We came to the conclusion in around 2011, uh, 2012, that about 30% of our shootings and murders were coming from gangs, or what we call in New York crews, loosely associated gangs. There were about 315 in, in the city. So what we did was to double the size of the gang division. In, in each unit, we put a social media expert because we determined that a lot of the dissing that w was going on was on Twitter or Facebook. And you know, to get in front of uh, someone's house with the gang signs, that's the person who's going to be shot or uh, killed. We put a lawyer in each one of those units to liaise with the district attorneys. Because in New York City, each county has its own district attorney. Uh, we put a uniform component in precincts where, uh, you know, there was a problem with the, with the uh, crews to be disruptive. This all worked. It resulted in 450 indictments in 25 major cases. It drove the number of shootings to record lows. I'm talking 2013. Uh, record lows. It, uh, the number of murders were at, at record lows because it just took a big chunk out. Sometimes it's staring you right in the face and, and you know, say, wow, why, you know, why don't we do that? I'm, I'm in a process of advising some, some other cities and a lot of their problems are gang related. They just didn't see it. And I asked in one city, I asked what percentage of your murders are gang related? They told me 6%. I said, now you better take a look at that. They came back and they said 60%. Now, why was there such a differential? They just weren't paying attention to it. So I think you know, specialized units focusing on, on certain issues, certain problems can, uh, can work. I, I don't think you have to go too much deeper than that in terms of you know, psychological uh, profiling. And, and the city, by the way, the police department has kept this program in place, and that's what, that's what has kept the uh, murders and, and, and shootings down. With that, I want to say thank you for an thank hour you. of conversation and discussion I think will be useful for the conversation ahead. And I want to say thank you to all of you for being part of this discussion. I wish you a terrific rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail. I appreciate it. Thank you. And if I could, I would ask our distinguished chair, General Jacoby, and our director, Colonel Collins, to please come forward.